In the 18th century, a French philosopher, very clever, said, look, I've got a button here, right on my table. You press this button, you get anything you want, anything. Untold riches, the love of beautiful women, inexhaustible power, anything you want. The only slight impediment is that 10,000 miles away in China, a peasant will drop dead in his tracks. You will cause his death. The question that he raised is, who amongst us would refrain from pressing the button and who amongst us would be content to have that button in wide currency? I've always thought that was a profound moral question. A profound moral question. A few years ago, and we're now spanning 300 years, a well-known cosmologist, Speaking off the cuff is almost everyone who says anything interesting about cosmology speaks off the cuff because the official doctrine is so absurd. <laughs> Speaking off the cuff said, you know, I understand quantum mechanics and uh, I sort of get all this stuff, but you know, I have a, I have a, a simple-minded question. And you know when anybody ever says, I have a simple-minded question, the question is not simple-minded, she's just embarrassed to ask it. Tell me, he talked to other cosmologists, tell me, you got the electron, right? It's going around, you know, whiz, 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 and it follows an orbit. And that orbit, determines the chemistry of ordinary life. And that electron does the same thing all the time. What compels the electron to stay in its orbit? Notice the choice of words. What compels the electron to stay in its orbit? Notice the resonance. What compels us not to press the button? Notice the questions are the same. What is the source of binding compulsion, whether in the moral life or in physical life? Notice at once this transgresses the boundaries of Galileo's universe. This is not uniquely a question about the book of God's work because we're talking about a moral issue. This is not uniquely a question about the physical world for the same reason. And yet, when you look at the logical form of the question, what compels the electron? Again and again and again. And what's stopping you from pushing that button, killing a Chinese peasant, and making yourself infinitely rich? There is some compulsive force at work that we all recognize but cannot name. There are attempts in the literature to make that clear, but they've all been failures. For example, we might say that the laws of nature owe their compelling force to their logical form. They're necessary, just like the laws of logic. The trouble with that theory is they're not necessary. We can very easily imagine an alternative to the laws of nature as we understand them. And by the same token, we cannot say the laws of moral life, the compelling force that stops us from killing an innocent victim simply to enrich ourselves, are necessary. They could be otherwise. We cannot appeal to necessity of any logical sort in order to make this point. Well, then maybe nothing determines it. Maybe we live in a nihilistic intellectual world. OK, that's a possibility too. But are you prepared to say, ladies and gentlemen, that for this reason, a question like, 
What compels the electron to follow its orbit is meaningless. I don't think so. We recognize the question as deeply significant. Here we stand at a very considerable remove from what Galileo thought of as the book of God's work. We're reaching questions that the book cannot answer and that its interpreters cannot read. It is quite true that the scientific community believes you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. But that is a maxim that cuts two ways, doesn't it? There's nothing preventing us from saying, with respect to the scientific community, here are questions. And we are prepared to say, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting because you cannot answer the questions that haunt and oppress us. One of the dominant convictions urged upon the human race by the scientific community concerns a certain myth that the progress of science, which is real, which is very powerful, which is very significant, no one should doubt it, has meant progressively a disenchantment with nature and a form of cultural humiliation whereby at every step in the development of the sciences, human beings and their works have been demoted from a central position and reduced to the margins. Apparently, Stephen Jay Gould, for example, argues this, this process began in the 16th century with the discovery that in fact, in fact, the Earth is not the center of the universe. It continued step by step over the course of three centuries and it reached an apogee with Darwin and the discovery that in fact human beings are nothing but a continuation squalid enough of the animal kingdom, cousin and kin to every shambling and repulsive thing that lives, and hardly distinguished from the great apes except for the acquisition of a few adventitious characteristics of no particular significance. Get used to it. Now this, I think, has been drummed into popular consciousness with absolutely no interruption. Each step of this progression is, of course, absurd. No one who believes that the Earth is the center of the universe is prepared to make purely a geographical argument. Home is where the heart is, not where geography points. And if we say that the Earth is at the center of the universe, we mean something quite different than the geometrical center. In 1915, Albert Einstein published the field equations for general relativity. Remarkable, remarkable, beautiful equations where he drew a connection between the curvature of space and time and the behavior of matter was a new theory of gravity, a radical theory of gravity, an accurate theory of gravity. And of course, the equations of general relativity are very complicated. They're nonlinear. It's not easy to solve them. They have many, many levels of hidden complexity and meaning. Even 90, 100 years later, we hadn't finished with the equations of general relativity. Einstein had hoped that they would reveal a universe proceeding sedately from the everlasting to the everlasting. He looked and looked and he said, yeah, well, I can, I can figure out a way to make my equations do that. What his equations were really telling him, and he didn't see this, is that the universe is not proceeding from everlasting to everlasting. It is expanding. It's expanding dynamically. Space and time are erupting. And if it's expanding, if you run the equations backwards, it follows, does it not, that the universe must have been expanding from something, an initial point. 
when Ed, Edmund, or Edward, I forgot, uh, Hubble discovered the redshift in the late 1920s, building on earlier work by American astronomers, he confirmed the expansion of the universe. And Einstein said, ah, not to have seen that in 1915 was my greatest blunder. My greatest blunder. So the picture that's offered by cosmology today is a picture of an expanding universe. The inference, almost irresistible, is that it is a universe expanding from an initial point when the universe was much smaller, much hotter, much denser, much more compact than it is today. A universe erupting out of nothingness 15 billion years ago may I ask you, suggest just what as an ancillary text? Well, I wouldn't know. What might it suggest? In the beginning, physicists at first were thunderstruck. Penzias, Arnold Penzias was one of the discoverers of the microwave background radiation. He said, hey, I didn't need to study physics. It's all in the first five books of the Torah. Everything I needed to know. But of course, the counter reaction set in immediately. No, this can't quite be the, the case. <laughs> Where would we be as the sole interpreters of the book of God's work if, God forbid, there was another class of experts who had said it all along? <laughs> so the community of physicists has been arduous in trying to discover what's behind the Big Bang. The theories that result are really like some grotesque catechismal exercise. <laughs> well, what was behind the Big Bang was a pre-Big Bang. <laughs> and the pre-Big Bang was kind of like an egg. Only it wasn't really an egg, just kind of like an egg. <laughs> and that egg sort of contracted or maybe it sort of inflated. Or, as Vic Stenger would argue, no problem, no problem. This is the result of some other universe tunneling into what? Tunneling. <laughs> Quantum mechanical tunneling. Or, as Stephen Hawking would argue, look, if you, if you look at things the right way, you don't have to go back. You change the whole number system, and instead of going back to a singular point, you reach something like a sack. All times are the same. It's called a Wick transformation in quantum mechanics, where it works perfectly. It's absolutely nonsense in terms of cosmology. Oh yeah, the Wick transformation does the job. What is so interesting about these exercises, exercises in speculative cosmology, is of course the fact that they're absurd. The facts, widely accepted by the cosmological community, are quite simple. 15 billion years ago, the universe erupted out of what seems to be nothing. The trouble with those facts is that sitting here, under the impression of the authority of the scientific community, we can't make any sense of them. It's incoherent from nothing, nothing. What are we to say? We can't say in all good conscience what we might wish to say. Look, there's a biblical tradition that says it perfectly clearly. In the beginning, God created the heaven. What more do you need? That's not sophisticated. That's not compelling. That cannot be expressed in the uh, recondite language of mathematical physics, although it can be expressed in plain English and is expressed in plain English. These animadversions sit very ill with the community of professional cosmologists. They are made uneasy by it. We are made at ease by the same animadversions. This is another example, I think, where the scientific community has endeavored with an enormous amount of energy to say to the rest of us, 
And of course, I count myself as a member of the scientific community. I'm trying to straddle the fence. <laughs> Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Each of these large, culturally significant attempts has had a tremendous influence on American society and also on European society. And they have all been, in some respects, intellectual failures. What conclusion should we draw from all this? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. How things will play out, largely unknown. That's always as it's been. But I, when I was thinking about this talk this afternoon, I recalled a wonderful uh, story about Sir Richard Burton, the great uh, imperial explorer, not the actor. Burton was a profound Arabist. He was deeply involved with Arabic culture. And he loved the desert. The end of his life, sick, depressed, seeing death coming, he said to himself, following an Arab tradition and poetry, we are as if embedded in a desert tent as the evening is drawing on. We see a few stars in the sky and what we hear receding in the distance is the tinkle of camel bells. That is, I think, where we all are and perhaps we all should be.